multi-agent environments. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Smitra Ganesh. I'm a research director at JP Morgan AI Research, and I work primarily on multi-agent systems and reinforcement learning. So what I thought I'd do today is uh, give a brief overview of some of the types of research problems that we're working on uh, in the multi-agent systems group. Uh, and then I'll dig in into more detail on one specific project. So we have, by the way, several different groups at uh, AI Research. Uh, we have Daniel from the cryptography group here uh, and also Parisa from the multi-agent systems and auto group. So that's really a big focus for our group uh, from the beginning actually has been the modeling of complex economic systems and markets. And in this area, uh, we are very much engaged in using multi-agent oral and game theoretic techniques to learn agent behaviors and the equilibria of these systems at scale. We uh, actually open source two packages uh, for agent-based modeling of these kinds of complex systems. So if you're interested in, uh, in checking them out. But besides modeling the equilibria of these systems, we are also interested in optimizing the decision-making for a single agent in this complex system surrounded by other strategic agents. And uh, one example of a project uh, in this category is this collaboration with Professor Furong Wang at uh, University of uh, Maryland. And here we looked at uh, uh, creating uh, defenses against test time attacks uh, on policies that are largely launched through communication channels. We're also interested in questions around mechanism design. Uh, I saw quite a bit of that uh, in, the, in the lightning talks earlier today. One question that props up uh, uh, repeatedly for us is this question of fair and efficient resource allocation. We allocate different types of resources to our customers. Uh, and we would like to do this in a way that is both efficient in terms of resource utilization for us, but also fair across our customers and in a way that maximizes their long-term welfare. The challenge here is that these uh, requests for these resources uh, come in at different points in time. For instance, they might come over the course of a day and at the time the request comes in, we have to make an allocation decision immediately without knowledge of what uh, other demands might come in through the rest of the day and also in a way that is robust to strategic behaviors. This is again a project that Parisa is leading here. So if anyone is interested in discussing more, uh, we can do that during the break. Lastly, we are very interested in developing ways in which we can leverage domain knowledge about problem structure and constraints to make reinforcement learning more sample efficient. Now we've found that in applying deep RL in particular to several real world problems, uh, A, there is a lot of domain knowledge that exists about these problems. And B, getting deep RL to work well for these problems is often this subtle art of injecting this knowledge about constraints and about structure into the problem formulation. So from a practical standpoint, we are interested in developing ways in which we can make this process more systematic and transparent. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about uh, today in more detail. Specifically, I'll be talking about um, a piece of work that we did around factored policy gradients, where we leverage structure in multi-objective MDPs for more efficient learning. Let me motivate this, this problem with an example. So let's consider a market maker that prior streams prices for uh, different assets to multiple uh, electronic trading venues. And at each of these venues, it buys and sells this asset at the prices it is uh, advertising and it ends up earning some transactional revenue and establishing some market share. And also as a result of all this uh, trading, it ends up with some net inventory across all these venues and it has to manage the risk that arises from this inventory. So what is the market maker optimizing for? It is trying to maximize the revenue uh, aggregated across these venues. It is also interested in optimizing some function of the market share across these venues and it is interested in minimizing risk. Now, these kinds of multi-objective 
reward functions are actually very common, uh, at least in our domain. I would say it is, it is almost the norm. So there's rarely an occasion where a business only cares about one thing. So it is a very important class of problems for us to tackle. And if you apply RL to this combined reward to find optimal prices for these end venues, what you typically find is that the learning is very slow and it scales very poorly as the action space, that is the number of venues uh, grows. As you can see, there's a fair amount of structure in this problem because the revenues and the market share at a particular venue depend on the prices that are streamed to that venue, but are conditionally independent uh, of the other prices. But all prices impact the inventory and hence the risk. So the question is whether we can exploit the structure of this problem for more efficient learning and do this, of course, not just for this problem, for, but for a more general class of problems. So to formalize this uh, a bit, let's consider a fairly standard Markov decision process, an MDP, uh, with a multi-objective reward. So the reward function R here is composed of M components. And our goal is to solve for an optimal policy pi, which is a distribution over actions condition on the state that you're in. And this optimal policy uh, should maximize the, this objective function here, which is essentially the cumulative discounted rewards uh, in expectation, starting from different initial states at zero. A class of methods uh, in reinforcement learning policy gradient methods solve this problem directly by uh, doing gradient ascent on this objective. And they use a key result called the policy gradient theorem to do this. And what the policy gradient theorem states is that the gradient of this objective can be computed using the state action value function, that's the Q function there, and the uh, score function of the policy. And in practice, you can replace this uh, Q function with any unbiased estimate. And what is typically used is the reward to go. So what is the discounted cumulative reward that you observe uh, when you start from status and apply some action A? And I'm going to refer to this uh, reward to go or really any unbiased estimate of Q uh, as this function psi. And this function psi, the objective, will also have the same multi-objective structure as the reward function. Furthermore, we, as I said, we are looking to exploit structure. We are going to assume that the psi has, uh, is factored in the sense that the jth component of the psi depends on some subset of the action space. So take a con to take a concrete example, maybe you have a three-dimensional action space and the psi is made up of three components where the first one depends on the first two dimensions of the action space, the second depends on all three, and the third depends only on the, on the last dimension. To start exploiting the structure in some way in the policy updates, we first need to represent it. And we do this using a graphical model that we call the influence network. So the influence network is a bipartite graph uh, with the action dimensions and the uh, components of the objective. And the edges of this graph indicate uh, which action dimensions influence which uh, uh, components of the, uh, of the objective. And this is building on top of work, uh, you know, there's precedent for this kind of uh, representation in factored MDPs, uh, as well as uh, more recent work on influence-based abstractions. Now to actually make this work with the policy gradient updates, you also need to take the policy factorization into account because the policy distribution is rarely, you know, one giant distri joint distribution. You typically uh, would write your policy as a product of some, uh, uh, some distributions. And the, uh, these policy, uh, the factors are defined by a set of complete and uh, disjoint partitions over the action space. So to take an example here, your policy distribution might be the product of two factors, the first one over the first two dimensions of the action space and the second over the third. But this is quite easy to kind of incorporate. We can group together the action dimensions that correspond to each policy factor. And we can now transform this into a, what we call a factored influence network. And this factored influence network now captures the dependencies between the policy factors and each of these um, uh, components of the objective. The one thing to note here is that policy factorization is actually a design choice that you make. 
So typically you, you kind of, uh, you would put down some formulation for this policy, for these policy factors based on some knowledge that you have about the correlation structure of actions. And if you don't have any prior information, you might uh, choose to go with an isotropic distribution. I will not cover this in detail in this talk, but in the paper, we also kind of post the, flip this question on, on its head and say, okay, what, given the structure of the influence network, what would actually be a good policy factorization to use? And you can actually derive that from the structure of the influence network. And what you see here is an example of what is a minimal uh, factorization, policy factorization for this influence network. Okay, so then the key insight here uh, in terms of leveraging the structure is that we want to attribute the improvements in these objective components only to the policy factors that are responsible for generating them. So to give an example, if we, under some policy, we observe a huge improvement in the Psi-1 component, then that should only be attributed back to the first policy factor and not the second. And in fact, if you attribute it to the second policy factor, it's only going to add noise to its update and increase the variance. So the way we achieve this uh, is to propose a factored baseline. So the baseline for the ith policy factor is of the form shown here, where k is the uh, bi-adjacency matrix of this graph. What it essentially does is during the update, it takes out the components of the objective that are not linked to that particular policy factor in the, uh, in the network here. And we prove that factor baselines are indeed valid control variates uh, if the factored influence network is unbiased. That is, you have perfect knowledge and it is true to the MDP. So how does this work uh, in practice? We, uh, we did some experiments on uh, a somewhat toy problem, which is the search bandit, which has been used in other papers before. Uh, it's a simple problem, but it helps you study the scaling uh, of these kinds of algorithms well. And in the search bandit problem, the goal is for the action to locate this, uh, the coordinate C here. And there is also a penalty for um, uh, uh, regularization term on the actions. In any case, uh, in the interest of time, the main, the key takeaway here is that factor policy gradients perform really well compared to vanilla policy gradients with um, uh, state dependent baselines or even action dependent baselines. And in fact, action dependent baselines take about two orders, orders of magnitude more wall clock time to run. But more interestingly, let's look at a kind of more real example, which is traffic optimization. And we did experiments on this traffic grid environment where the objective is to control the tra these traffic lights on the grid to optimize traffic flow. And this is an interesting problem because this is really reflective of most real world situations where you don't actually know your influence network. And here we made a, a reasonable assumption to say that we're going to assume that the reward terms that are associated with streets that are not directly connected to a traffic signal are not going to be uh, influenced by the actions of a traffic signal. Is that true? No, uh, it's, it's an assumption. And the, uh, the issue with that is that it will introduce bias in your updates. But what we found in practice is that the gains that you get from variance reduction actually far outweigh uh, any bias that you introduce. And you can see that in the learning curves here where the factored policy gradient with this localization assumption outperforms both a joint power policy with global rewards as well as a shared policy with global rewards. So, you know, this, this really um, opens up the question of can we actually start with some uh, assumption about the influence network. And then as we go along, we update and, uh, and this, this assumption based on experience. And I want to leave, uh, end with this, with this uh, diagram here, because this is really kind of what we are trying to achieve, which is that we have explicit representations where we can capture human, human domain knowledge about a problem. Uh, we can leverage it for more efficient learning. Uh, and we can also refine and update this representation based on experience. Thank you.
All right, our next speaker who will be appearing soon is Takamitsu Tanaka from Rock360. Talk is unique challenges and opportunities in working with residential real estate data. Hello.